Hi, my name is Doug Ellison. I'm the engineering camera team lead for the Curiosity Mars rover. I'm going to talk to you today about what the engineering cameras on the Curiosity rover are, um, why they are the way they are, and what we do with them with the Curiosity rover. And you'll see the title here is Photographing Mars One Black and White Megapixel at a Time. And I'm going to talk about why they're only black and white, why they're only one megapixel, but why they're still incredibly useful for exploring Gale Crater on the surface of Mars. This is the Curiosity rover before it left uh, Earth and headed off to Mars. You can see it's pretty big. You can see an engineer sitting at the back here. And the Curiosity rover is about a ton. It's about seven feet tall. Um, it's a huge piece of engineering. And you can see it's got wheels. It's got a robotic arm. It's got a mast up there with cameras on it so it can look around. And that mast is there for us to be able to see a little bit further to see 10, 20, 30, 50 meters away from the rover, to see the lay of the land, to see the terrain, to see what's interesting around us. Here's that mast up close. You can see there's a whole bunch of different cameras on here. So there's a big kind of cyclops looking thing up at the top there. That's an instrument called ChemCam that can do analysis of rocks from a distance. Then below that in the middle are two cameras. One looks a little bit smaller than the other. Those are our color scientific cameras. Those are called mast cam. And then outside of that, on the edge, are two pairs of cameras, and those are called our navigation cameras. And they're the cameras I'm mainly going to talk to you about today. We have two computers on the Curiosity rover. We've got one computer we use and another computer that's a spare. And we've got a complete set of these uh, engineering cameras tied to each of those two computers. And so the pair at the top are used with our A computer. The pair at the bottom are used with our B computer. And here's the front of the rover. And if you look closely, right at the front of the rover, you can see a line of four little cameras. These are called our front hazard cameras. And again, there's four there, but they're in two pairs, one for one computer, and one for the other. And they're to see right in front of the rover to see what the mast couldn't see because there's bits of rover in the way, right? We can see all the terrain right in front of the rover between the front wheels. We can identify which rocks we might want to look at more closely with the robotic arm. Uh, we can check for hazards in front of the rover when we're driving. And we have another set of cameras like this on the back of the rover as well. And so these ones are called the front hazard cameras and the ones at the back, would you believe, are called the rear hazard cameras. And so all of those together, the navigation cameras up on the mast, the front hazard cameras and the rear hazard cameras, all together are called the engineering cameras. Why are they only black and white? Well, there's no such thing really as a color camera. Cameras only can count light and they don't really care what color it is. And you put a filter in front of that light to figure out the different colors that you're looking at. If you could zoom in incredibly close into the sensor inside the back of a smartphone camera, you'd see that it's an array of red pixels and green pixels and blue pixels that get merged into a color picture. Now we can do the same thing with some of our cameras on Curiosity, our mast cam, the mast cameras, they are actually color to look at different things in rocks, to look up, up close with things. But for the navigation cameras, we're just black and white because it actually only takes about a third of the data to take a black and white picture that is a color picture. This is the picture I took of a newborn zebra at the LA Zoo a few weeks ago, right? There's a color picture on the left hand side and then just the red bit, just the green bit and just the blue bit. Now, in all of those, you can still see there's two adult giraffes and their newborn baby giraffe in the picture, okay? If you're just worried about driving around and you know avoiding giraffes, any of those pictures would be absolutely fine. And so for our navigation cameras, we're actually kind of just like a red camera and we just take these black and white pictures and we save lots of data volume by only taking a black and white picture. Now, why is it only red that we care about? Well, look at this picture from orbit. This is a, a big patch of Mars. It's about a mile wide and there's not an awful lot of green going on here. There's not an awful lot of blue going on here. All the variation, all the diversity, all the information we might use to figure out where we're going to drive or what we're going to look at, it's kind of all different shades of red and black, right? And so that's why our cameras are black and white and mainly focused around what things would look like in kind of red light. And if you look really, really closely, you can actually see the Curiosity rover is hiding. I'll draw a little uh, mark for you here. The Curiosity rover is actually hiding right up there. There's a Curiosity rover right there in that orbital picture. This was taken a, a couple of years ago. Why are they only one megapixel? 
you know, the very first iPhone had a better camera than this, and that was 10 years ago. Well, our cameras actually started life in the 1990s. Um, they were designed as part of a project that was going to be called Apex, a payload for a Mars lander that was going to fly to Mars in 2001 and have one megapixel cameras, which for their time were cutting edge. But that mission was cancelled and ended up being reborn as what became the Spirit and Opportunity rovers in 2003. And in that family portrait of all our Mars rovers there, you can see the Spirit and Opportunity testbed rover on the left hand side behind the engineers. Well, they had this one megapixel sensor designed for that cancelled mission, and they used that same one megapixel sensor for all the other cameras on that rover. And would you believe it had navigation cameras on the mast and then hazard cameras on the front and the back of the rover? Well, when it came to building the Curiosity rover's set of cameras, we're like, well, these work. They've been used on Mars for quite a while. They're clearly really good for doing the job. We'll just use them again. And so more of the same cameras were built for the Curiosity rover. And so heritage basically meant we'll just use what we already have. We'll use what we know works. We'll use what we know is good. And also, like the challenge with color taking up more data volume, one megapixel is less data than two or four, 12 megapixels. The average picture from an iPhone these days might be three, four, five megabytes in size. Uh, our pictures are more like a tenth of that. Uh, if that, they can actually be really quite small because it's only a one megapixel image. This is the first hit. If you search for USB stick on Amazon, you get this. Uh, the most popular USB stick on Amazon is a 128 gigabyte USB stick for $17. You can have it tomorrow if you order it today. Um, it would take us about three years to fill a USB stick that big with the rate that we can get data back to Earth from the Curiosity rover. Now, we don't send data from the rover straight to Earth. We actually tend to use a fleet of Mars orbiters as relay satellites to help us get an awful lot more data than we otherwise would. But still, we only get 20, 50, 100, sometimes if we're really lucky, 150 or 200 megabytes of data back from the rover every single day. And so we have to be very careful with how much data we collect and not collect more data than we can actually return to Earth. And so those one megapixel black and white cameras are part of that effort to make sure we're taking no more data than we need, and we're taking no more data than we can return back to Earth. So what do we do with our one megapixel engineering cameras? Well, they're used for navigation. They're used for getting a look at the lay of the land, figuring out where we're gonna go next, figuring out where we've been, figuring out exactly where we are. That nice, pretty orbital map of Mars I just showed you with the little rover in it, we can actually use our pictures from the rover in conjunction with those orbital pictures to actually exactly line up where we are, which is really, really useful for figuring out where we're going to go next. We also use it for targeting, i.e. we look at the terrain around us and we can look at the interesting rocks and we can say, you know what, that rock looking, looks interesting. Let's take higher resolution color pictures of that. Let's use our laser spectrometer up on the mast with that, or let's get out the robotic arm and put our microscope or our spectrometer onto that rock, or maybe even use our drill to drill into the rock, collect a sample of and for analysis by the instruments inside the rover. Documentation. We also take pictures when we're doing stuff. Using the robotic arm, if we get one of the instruments and we take the arm and we put it on the ground, we take a picture of it so that later on we can check, OK, we wanted to touch this particular rock here. Is that the rock we actually touched? Kind of uh, kind of a post diagnostic of exactly how well our activities have gone. Also, if something goes wrong with the rover, it actually knows to take some pictures to help diagnose what might have gone wrong as well. And finally, we do do our own science with these cameras, predominantly with our environmental science theme group. Um, and they look for things like clouds and dust devils and other kind of weather phenomenon on Mars. And I'll show you a whole bunch of those uh, towards the end of these slides. So navigation. Um, here's another orbital picture of Mars. It's black and white. Uh, the rover, again, is in here. I'll mark it out for you. The rover is, make sure I don't miss it. The rover's way up there. I've got a little zoom in. I'll show you in just a second. But if this was all you had and you wanted to get the rover from up there to, say, the bottom right hand corner of this, you don't really know how safe that terrain is. How rocky is it? How, you know, how safe is it for the rover? How bad are the slopes and things like that? It's very hard to try and navigate a rover with just something like this. It'd be like trying to 
walk from your house to the shops just using Google Earth, but with your eyes closed, right? You wouldn't get there and you'd run into things and you might get run over, right? You never know what you're going to come across. And that's why we need to have these cameras to help with navigation. If you can't see it, there's the rover right up there. That's the very best images we get from orbit around Mars. And you can just about see the rover. Uh, in this case, it's just parked next to a small field of sand dunes. And so this is what that image uh, looks like on the ground. This is the surroundings of the rover. Actually, at the time of me recording this, uh, in the middle of November, this is where the rover is right now. And these images and these mosaics, you can get just as quickly as the images make it down to Earth. We put them online for anybody to look at. Now, let's say we want to head towards that big mountain you can see in the distance. And actually, that's kind of where we're going with the rover. You can look at this terrain and you can go, well, I can't go straight up the hill here. It's too jaggedy. It's too steep. There's rocks in the way. But I could take a turn off to the left here and I could maybe go around the back of these rocks and then carry on up that way. You can use these pictures to get the lay of the land, figure out where the safe passage might be to send the rover on towards a distant target. And we can also look at particular rocks. This is a rock we spent several months parked next to, would you believe, and go, OK, this rock's really interesting from a scientific perspective. It represents an interesting geological unit of where we are. Let's do a series of really, really uh, detailed analytical studies of this rock with the instruments inside the rover. We're going to drill into this rock. Well, we can use this data to figure out which is the safest part of this rock to drill. Where do we want to put our other instruments? And would you believe we didn't drill this rock just once? We actually ended up drilling this rock three different times and we're able to understand it was possible to do that from looking at pictures like this one. And when we've done a big drilling campaign like that, we always take a self-portrait afterwards. Now, this is with one of the color cameras on the rover. It's actually, this is taken with our microscope. Now, the engineering camera team aren't responsible for the microscope. That's a different team. Um, but it does so that we do sometimes take color pictures with our rover. And we take these selfies by taking the robotic arm and sticking it out in front of the rover and turning that microscope around and pointing it back at the rover and taking about 50 different pictures and stitching them all together to take these really cool self-portraits. But the important thing here is you can actually see right down here, there are those three drill holes on that same rock I just showed you. There they all are there. And this was probably the most focused study we ever had of, of one particular rock with the rover. That was just a, a month or two ago. Documentation. Uh, that was the next thing I talked about. Well, we document almost everything we do with the rover. When we finish driving, we take post-drive imaging. And when we're using the robotic arm, every time any one tool touches any one target, we take images like this. These are called documentation images. And it's to see exactly where the robotic arm was when that particular measurement was taken or that particular activity was completed. We can also do things like documenting driving around as well. So in this case, on the left hand side, we actually came, uh, we were parked here and we wanted to drive away. And the first thing we were going to do is steer. What you're looking at there is the looking straight down onto the front right wheel of the rover parked on a rock. And that wheel stalled. You know, the rover told the wheel to turn and it wouldn't turn. It actually got hung up on the rock. And so the next day we're like, well, we need to back up off this rock. We can't just turn it where we are, but let's take a picture of it now to see exactly the situation that got us into this trouble in the first place. We are able to document the problem and then understand it better to avoid doing something like that in the future. On the right hand side, you can actually see one set of wheel tracks looking out behind the rover. And this was a drive that we were doing across some fairly benign, slightly rubbery terrain. But in the middle of it, we tested a new piece of software on the rover that's called traction control that helps uh, kind of take some of the strain and the stress off the wheels as we're driving over rocks. We turned it on halfway through this drive, then we turned it off again, and then we stopped and looked back behind us to see exactly how the wheel tracks had changed while we ran it, and also to document exactly where the wheels were when we tested that flight software update. And finally, science, actual science we do with these cameras. Um, now, we can never know for sure if there's going to be clouds or things like this, dust devils or other phenomenon around. And so many of these activities are kind of like a fishing trip. We'll set up a set of observations, what in most cases kind of like a little short time lapse movie. In this case, this is about a 20 frame long movie that lasts about four minutes. And we pick what we think might be the best direction to look. And then we ask the rover to look in that direction. And then we hope there's something interesting in it. And a lot of the time we actually don't see dust devils or clouds, but that's an important data point as well. It tells us, well, there isn't something here. That means there might be something at another time. 
And this is one of the best Dust Devils we've ever seen. This was just a few months ago. Um, this Dust Devil probably formed on kind of warm, sun-facing slopes of a little hill about a quarter of a mile away. We can tell from kind of the hills that appears to be behind and the hills that appears to be in front of just how far away it is. It's probably about a quarter of a mile to half a mile away. Uh, and it's about five or so meters across and goes off the top of this image. So it's actually probably about 50 meters tall. It's a pretty big uh, dust devil. Now, dust devils are very tenuous. They can be pretty hard to see. And so this isn't just the raw images as they came down from the rover. To really enhance things like dust devils or clouds, what we'll actually sometimes do is take all the images in the sequence and then we'll just highlight the differences between each individual picture and all the pictures averaged out. And that really helps enhance little transient things like this, this little dust devil uh, blowing by. If you turn that technique really, really up, really, really high, you can see super tenuous things that you wouldn't, might not even see with the naked eye. So on the left hand side, you can actually see the real sequence of images taken. And if you look really closely, you might just be able to see a very tenuous little bright feature going from left to right. But if we take the difference between each frame and, and the whole stack of these images, you can see on the right hand side, it was a dust devil going right by the rover and actually kind of breaking up just as it went past us. And this is about a, a two or three minute uh, duration little movie right, in, right behind the rover. You can do the same thing, but not looking across the ground for dust devils, but looking up in the sky for clouds. And on the left, you might just be able to see the tenuous clouds, but if you really, really stretch the difference between all the images, you get an image like the one on the right hand side. Now, what's tricky with these is knowing how high they are. We can't really know exactly how high these clouds are, and so we can't really figure out how fast they're moving. Okay, They might be quite low and moving quite slowly, or they might be really, really high and moving really, really quickly. Well, one technique the science team came up with is to pair this observation with another one where we look across the terrain in front of the rover in the hope that we'll actually see the shadows that these clouds are casting on the ground. If we can see the shadows moving on the ground, we can then figure out how fast they're moving. If we now know how fast these clouds must be moving, then we can figure out how high they are. And once we know how high they are, then we, technically we can use this to measure high altitude wind speeds on another planet, which is a really cool thing to do and really helpful for understanding how Mars's weather actually behaves. Sometimes we get really, really lucky. Um, and sometimes during particular parts of the Mars year, you can get clouds forming near twilight, around sunset or just after sunset. And we caught one in a short movie we did with just one single image pointed in one direction, taken a few times. And we caught some pretty tenuous little clouds. And so we actually added more images to that mosaic and we made it into a little mosaic like this, like a three by one mosaic, three pictures wide. And we took it several times. You can see three times in a row here. And this is about 45 minutes to an hour after sunset. We're looking kind of uh, northwest-ish here. The sun is setting off to the left-hand side. You can probably see it there. Um, you're not seeing the sun. You're just seeing kind of the bright sky left behind by the sunset. And these clouds are moving um, towards the west. They're actually blowing from east to west towards the sunset. Uh, what's amazing is these are a phenomenon called noctilucent clouds. The rover is in the dark. It's past sunset where the rover is, but these clouds are actually still in sunshine uh, at really, really, really high altitudes. Uh, and so that can tell you something about what's happening in the upper atmosphere of Mars. But from my point of view, as someone who writes the, the commands to take the pictures, they're just really, really pretty. And sometimes we do stuff just because it's really cool and interesting and because we can. This is what sunrise looks like on Mars. We were parked up near a cliff that's about 15 meters tall, and it was an interesting opportunity to actually take a movie when sunrise had already happened. Like if you could have peered up above these rocks and looked out towards the distant horizon, sunrise had already happened. But it hadn't happened for the rover because it was still hidden behind this little cliff. We were in this, this little cliff's shadow. And so we commanded a set of images to be taken just as the sun appeared out behind that cliff. And the pattern of brightness around these pictures, how bright the sky appears, the gradient of that pattern from where the sun is off to the edge of the images can tell you something about how much dust is in the atmosphere, 
her the size of that dust and that can tell you about how that dust can move around how that dust can form part of regional or local or even global dust storms and this is one of my favorites it's really quite strange and it's very very subtle but again this was taken after sunset and what you might see is this funny gray blob just appear on the right hand side and then disappear amazingly that is actually the shadow of one of Mars's two moons. This is the shadow of a moon called Phobos. Mars has solar eclipses. They're not total solar eclipses like we have here on Earth. They're only partial, but they do make the sky darker. They make the ground darker, actually, if we're looking out across the terrain when a, when a, uh, when a, a Phobos eclipse happens. We see it on the ground. But in this case, we waited for one that was happening after sunset, a bit like those twilight clouds and took a movie in the direction of the sun to see if we would see the shadow of Phobos being cast onto the dusty atmosphere above us. There's not a lot of science in this. We just did it because it's really, really cool to see the shadow of a moon on a planet about 100 million miles away from home. Now, I'm just one small part of the rover's engineering team. Uh, this is one of our regular team photos. Hopefully, we'll all get to go back and work at JPL together in person at some point in the not too distant future and uh, get to share stories and, and work together in person once again. It's a really interesting, a really creative uh, team. There's some brilliant people in here, and it really is a pleasure to be a part of such a amazing team of people you know we didn't many of these people were not involved in designing and building this rover in fact most of those people have already moved off to the next project we're just the team who help operate the rover keep it as productive as we can keep it finding new things driving to new places figuring out new ways to use it figuring out things that people never thought you could do with this rover we're figuring out how to do them to keep it going and hopefully we'll get to do it together for many, many more years to come. For each and every one of us, it really is the privilege of a lifetime to get to work on a project like this. It's been really fun uh, telling you about some of the things we do with our engineering cameras and why they're only one megapixel, why they're only black and white, but why they're still an awesome part of the Curiosity rover mission. As I mentioned earlier, every single picture we ever take ends up on the JPL website. Um, almost immediately that it reaches the ground. Um, and if you think I'm cheating, I'm really not cheating here. Like if it's the weekend, I won't bother trying to VPN into work to use the tools to look at our most recent images. I'll just pick up my phone and go to that website just like anyone else can to see the most recent images that have come down from our spacecraft. And we also add the mosaics that we take at the end of every drive those mosaics also show up probably within an hour of them reaching the ground. Um, and you can look at those as well. They're kind of nice big uh, postcard size images of Mars. And on most forms of uh, social media, the rover has its own persona uh, chattering away at, at Mars Curiosity. Thanks for listening. Stay safe and stay curious.